Happy Mother's Day, everyone. So thankful you're all here with us today. I'm so thankful for all of our amazing moms here uh, who love so sacrificially and serve selflessly. Uh, truly all deserve to be honored. I am incredibly blessed in that I have a wonderful mother and stepmother and mother-in-law. And truly, I wouldn't be who I am today without their love and their support and their encouragement. Uh, I love them all so much. In fact, I wouldn't be at all today uh, if it wasn't for my mom, uh, who gave birth to me in the backwoods of Cheyenne, Wyoming in 1987, where they didn't have certain luxuries like epidurals. And I was 10 pounds, 13 ounces. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, my poor mom. Now, every Mother's Day, I write her an apology letter. <laughs> Mother's Day also reminds me of when my wife, Kathleen, gave birth to our daughter, Juliet, just a little over two years ago now. Uh, I have never felt more useless and in the way than that day. Like, I, I knew going in that my role was really just to, uh, you know, support and encourage and keep a level head, stay out of the way, you know, don't pass out. And I really did try my best to do all those things. I think I did pretty okay. Uh, but there was one moment when it was time for Kathleen uh, to start pushing, and I could just see that she was in so much pain, and I felt terrible. Like, all I wanted to do was take that pain away from her, and I couldn't. All I could think was, like, this is just so unfair, right? Like, uh, she has to endure all of this pain, and I'm here, and I'm fine. I just wanted to apologize to her. Like, Kathleen, I'm so sorry. Like, this is my fault. I did this to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't. I kept my cool. And I'll, I'll spare you the details of the birth, uh, except... Uh, there was this one moment in which I was in complete awe. The doctor said, all right, Kathleen, it's time for you to really start pushing now. We need to get this baby out. And I watched as Kathleen kind of just brushed aside all of her pain, and she tapped in to this like, primal part of herself, this spirit of pure like, determination and strength that I had never seen before. And she was so beautiful and intimidating in that moment. <laughs> Like, I realized the moment that she gave birth to new life, how easily she could end my life if she really wanted to. <laughs> but then I saw Juliet, our daughter, for the very first time. And, man, I was instantly in love. And it was that new kind of love I had never really uh, felt before. And I just couldn't stop looking at her. She was just so little and beautiful and furious. Man, was she mad. She was so mad. Uh, like, after I cut the cord and the nurses took her to, like, clean her up real quick and measure her and weigh her, she just looked like she wanted to fight someone. And I was like, honey, she looks just like you. And... <laughs> <laughs> but she, she did. Juliet looked just so, like, unsettled and uncomfortable which makes sense because she was just ripped out violently of the only world that she's ever known into this new world that's cold and it's full of giants and these overwhelming lights and sounds. And you could just see she just didn't want to be there. She's like, put me back. And until the nurses, they finally put Juliet on her mama's chest and you could just see her whole body finally start to relax as she curled in close to her mama. You could even see it in her face. You could see that she was finally somewhere comfortable again, where a place that felt safe and familiar to her. And I think on some level, all of us crave that kind of comfort, to be in a place that feels familiar and safe, where we can finally rest. In fact, David writes about this kind of comfort in Psalm 131, I want us to read it together. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you would like one, go ahead and raise your hand and an usher will come down the aisle and bring you one. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please keep that one. We love you. That's our gift to you. Uh, the words will also be up on the screen behind me. So here we go. Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord 
from this time forth and forevermore. I find it fascinating that when David tries to describe his relationship with God, of all the images that he could have used, he chose a little boy with his mama. Like when David thinks about being with God, he thinks about a little boy who loves his mama so much that all he wants to do is be in her arms. Dr. James Fowler, who is a developmental psychologist and a Christian ethicist, he found that our earliest understandings of God come from our parents, but particularly our mothers. We first learn who God is by the way we were loved and nurtured by our mothers. Dr. Fowler calls this our primal faith. And in this psalm, you can see David returning to his primal faith. At the beginning of the song, he talks about how he has humbled himself to realize that there are just some things that are too great and too marvelous for him. There are some questions with answers that are beyond our comprehension. And there are some problems that are just too big for us to solve or to control. And in fact, we were never meant to control them in the first place. And so David's learned to humble himself. He's learned to calm and quiet his soul, to find rest in God like a child in his mother's arms. And God wants this kind of relationship with all of us. He wants to be our place of refuge and comfort. In fact, God himself used the same type of maternal imagery in Isaiah 66, 13, when he said to his people, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. So when we encounter things that are beyond our control or comprehension, when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel bewildered, God wants us to calm and quiet our souls and rest in him, which sounds great. But I know that for some of us, that, just, that kind of relationship with God just doesn't sound feasible or even real. Right? I know that for some of us, God has never once felt like a comforting mother to us. I know that for others of us, even Mother's Day is a difficult and painful day because it reminds you of what you've lost or what you've never had. And so thinking of God in this way just isn't easy for you. And what's more, it feels like in our society, it's becoming more and more difficult to calm and quiet our souls. David was able to do it by relinquishing control of problems too big for him and by refusing to entertain questions with answers beyond his comprehension. But that's not what we want to do. That's not what we have been conditioned to do. We want answers to every question. We want solutions to every problem. We want to control things. And our world is happy to provide answers for us, even if it's not the full truth. And our world is happy to provide solutions to our problems, even if it's just a quick fix to numb our pain. And so instead of learning to calm and quiet our souls, we have learned to busy and numb ourselves. As evidenced by the fact that we are right now the most in-debt, overweight, addicted, and medicated population in U.S. history. And study after study is showing that we feel more isolated and alone than ever before. And a big reason for that, ironically, is social media where we have learned to compare and criticize others behind the safety of a screen instead of connecting with people face to face. We are unsatisfied in the richest nation on earth. We are tense, we are unsettled, and we all want some kind of relief. We all want some kind of comfort, right? And there's a market out there that's happy to provide your needs for a small fee. They'll numb you right up. For a small fee, they'll provide you with comfort and instant gratification, but it's only comfort for a little bit. It's not the same kind of comfort that David is talking about here in this psalm. The kind of comfort where our soul is calm and quiet, where we feel like little kids again, resting in the arms of our mother without a care in the world, where you can find that deep kind of rest that only comes when you know that everything is gonna be okay. That is the comfort that all of us are searching for, and it can't be bought, and it can't be manufactured. So essentially, our world is desperately searching for a mother. And I believe that this is where the church should step in. 
In fact, a lot of our early church fathers would, have, would refer to the church as the mother. I think that's exactly who we need to be. The church should be the mother the world is searching for. After all, we as a church, we are infused with God's very own spirit. We are Christ's body on earth, so we should be the physical, tangible place where people can experience God's comfort. And I want us to notice something in Psalm 131 that is subtle, but I think it's incredibly important. In the Psalm, God doesn't actually do anything for David to provide him comfort. God is just with him. God is just present with him. David presses into God and God is with him. And I think this is an important aspect of God that we often overlook. God doesn't just do things for us. God is with us. God doesn't just fix the world for us. God doesn't just shower us with blessings. God's heart is not to do things for us. You can do amazing, kind, and generous things for someone without ever knowing them. You can do things for someone at a distance. And that's not what God wants. God does not settle with only doing things for us. God's heart is to be with us. Just think about the difference between doing something for someone and being with someone. Like if you're raising a child, is it better to buy them everything they could ever need or want and to solve all their problems for them or simply spend time with them? Spending time with them, right? Absolutely. Like there's nothing more valuable than your presence. Like when Juliet, when my daughter Juliet, when she gets scared or hurt, she doesn't want me to buy her a new doll or bake her a cake. What she wants is her mama to come and scoop her up and hold her tight. That's what makes Juliet feel better in those moments. I think sometimes the most powerful and healing thing that we can do for someone is just be present with them. And that's God's heart, to be with us. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is not just that he came to die for us, but it's that he is Emmanuel, which means God with us. God didn't just come here to die, or Jesus didn't just come here to die. He lived life with us. He walked and talked and laughed and cried with us. People's hearts were electrified and their lives were transformed, not only because of the miracles he performed, but because they knew him. They considered him to be a friend. Like people just wanted to be in his presence. And even think about the cross. Think about what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Jesus gives everything that he is for the sake of being with us. On the cross, he conquered sin and death and Satan, the powers that stood between us and God that separated us so that neither death nor hell nor anything else can ever come between us again. He is with us always. In fact, Jesus' very last words in the book of Matthew are, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. And just think about how powerful that good news can be to a world that is feeling increasingly isolated and alone. And as the church, we have been given God's very own spirit, so we can be a constant reminder to the world that God has not abandoned his creation. God is here. God is with us. And our hope is that when people grow weary of quick fixes and numbing themselves for a fleeting moment of comfort, that they will see us as a light in the darkness. And we won't shout at them from a distance, hey, Jesus loves you. No, we're going to be there with them. We're going to be present with them. We're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus to wrap them up in God's love so they can rest in God like a child in their mother's arms. And if you're listening right now, and the comfort I just described is exactly what you've been looking for. You're tired. You want some rest. And if you've been feeling increasingly isolated and alone, and you want to believe so badly that God really is here with you, but you're just not sure. I want to challenge you to press into the church and see for yourself if what I'm saying is true. Like, there's a reason 
why we here are constantly offering opportunities for you to press in beyond just the Sunday morning service. We call those opportunities next steps. So on any given Sunday, you will hear announcements for things like summer study and fajitas and faith bridge and grow groups, micro groups, men's groups, women's groups, uh, serve teams, road mission journeys. All of those ministries exist because we want to be with you. We don't want to just do things for you. We want to walk alongside you. We want you to experience the comforting presence of God. But it's going to be very difficult for you to press into God for comfort if you are isolating yourself from his body. It would be like if you were expecting your mom to comfort you, but you only went over to her house once a week for a quick dinner and then you leave. Like, I'm sure the dinner was delicious and nutritious, and it maybe was even a little bit comforting. But it wasn't quite the comfort that you were hoping for, because that takes time with your mom to like talk things through with her, to allow her the opportunity to speak words of truth and wisdom over you, to remind you that you are loved and valuable and wanted. And that's what we want for you. Listen, pressing into the church, it's not gonna answer all your questions. We have a ton of questions ourselves. We can't fix all of your problems. We won't numb you. But we can be with you. Look at all of the people in here. We can surround you with loving arms. We can encourage you. We can bear your burdens with you. That's what we can do. If you press in, we will walk with you. We will be present with you. I was reminded of just how powerful being just present with someone can be. A few years ago, when I served with a ministry called Seven More Ministries for the very first time. Seven More is a ministry that works with people who were just released from prison, like literally just released from prison. And so we all met at a Greyhound station in downtown Houston where a busload of ex-convicts were due to, due to arrive uh, to us. And Josh, who's the leader of the ministry, he explained to me that um, if someone hops on a Greyhound right after they've been released from prison, it's most likely due to the fact that they either don't have any family or their family is too far away to pick them up, or their family just doesn't want to see them. And so the plan was that we were going to greet these men when they got off the bus, and we were going to offer them things like new shoes and new clothes and backpacks, and we had cell phones ready for them to use to try to figure out where they were going to go next, things like that. And this day was extra special um, because a local bakery had donated a bunch of cupcakes to Josh. And so Josh told us to greet each man as they got off the bus with a cupcake. Uh, and then we would talk with them and hear their stories and we would pray for them. And I don't know why, but the thought of giving a grown man who was just released from prison a cupcake, <laughs> it felt very strange to me, right? And I was already like super nervous at that point because this was my first time doing this. And uh, I'm already terrible at just striking up conversations with strangers. I'm real bad at small talk. And, uh, and I, at this point in my life, I hadn't really known many people who had been to prison before. And so my only idea of what an ex-convict would be like really came from like movies and uh, Beyond Scared Straight on A&E, <laughs> which are all ridiculous and cartoonish, but that's the concept that I had in my mind. And so the men, they start streaming off the bus and so I grab a cupcake, and immediately I lock eyes with this guy who was just, he's a giant of a man. Um, he was probably like three or four inches taller than me. He was big, uh, he was bald, and he was covered head to toe in tattoos. And uh, so I muster up my courage to, to start walking towards him, uh, and I have my cupcake, and the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, like, what in the world am I going to say to this guy when I get there? And I have no idea. So I come up to him, and I kind of froze for a minute. I'm like, here's a cupcake. And uh, that's what I said. <clears throat> and I was just waiting for him to say something like, I killed the last man that offered me a cupcake. You know, uh, he didn't, he didn't say that at all. Uh, all he said was, he took the cupcake and he just said, okay. And of course he looked very confused and a little bit suspicious. And so then I started explaining to him like what we're doing there. And he opened up a little bit. He told me a little bit of his story. Uh, and then he actually, he let me pray for him. And when we were done praying, he lifted up his head and I could see that he was emotional. 
Like he had tears in his eyes, uh, which I was not expecting at all because up until this point, he had shown very little emotion. And he could see the surprise on my face. And so he wiped his tears a little bit embarrassed. And he said, sorry, I, <clears throat> I just wasn't expecting this. I didn't think anyone would care that I got out of prison today. Thank you for the cupcake. And then he walked away. That was it. Um, I didn't do or say anything profound, I promise. <laughs> We'd only talked for a few minutes, and the cupcakes were pretty good, but I don't think they were worth tears. <laughs> he was moved to tears because someone was there, present with him, in a moment when he thought for sure he would be alone. And I think just like with being a parent, the most important or one of the biggest parts of being the church is just showing up for people, just being there with them. Like just your presence with someone is enough to make a world of difference. It's so comforting when you know that you're not alone. And I think that's the kind of comfort that our world needs. If we just show up and we're present with people, I think God will use our presence to transform and to heal lives. One of my favorite things about my job, I'm a grow groups coordinator, is I get to hear story after story of how our grow groups show up for people in need. I've heard stories of grow groups filling up entire waiting rooms um, because one of their members got sick and so they showed up to pray for that person and to be with their family members who are all just exhausted and worried. I've heard stories of grow groups throwing a surprise baby shower for a couple who's having their first baby. I've heard stories of grow groups who threw a surprise celebration for a couple who just adopted their first child. I've heard stories of grow groups who showed up to someone's house at 2.30 in the morning because that person had just received a distressing, disturbing phone call and they didn't want to be alone. I treasure hearing those kinds of stories because they remind me of what the church is supposed to do. Those are stories of the church surrounding people in need with God's comfort. Our world needs that comfort and rest. And I think that the true comfort and rest that the world needs can be found right here in this room. It's you, the body of Christ on earth. You are that comfort and rest. Let's go out and let's be a shining light that reminds the world that God is not absent. God is right here in our midst. God is with us, and he wants you to press into him and rest like a child in their mother's arms. Let me pray for us. Father, I'm just so thankful that you are a God who loves us beyond our comprehension. You love us so much that you're not satisfied with just doing things for us at a distance. You want to be near us. You want to be with us. You want to be right here in our midst. And I'm just so thankful for that truth. Father, and I'm also, I'm just incredibly thankful for all of the mothers here, for the way that they just love and serve so selflessly, for the way that they reflect your character, your goodness, your comfort, and your rest. And I pray for all the people who, maybe this is a tough day for them, I pray that right now you are providing them with that comfort and rest. I pray that they press into the church, that they don't isolate themselves, but that they can know you in a very real, tangible way. That they can know you like, like they would know their best friend or their spouse. Because that's how you want to be known. And I pray that as a church, we make you known to the entire world. That we are a reminder that you have not left us, but that you love us and you are right here. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.